So thanks again for joining us tonight. The plot to kidnap George Washington is our subject for tonight's webinar, um, starring our local author, who we love so much, Mr. William Hazelgrove. And I'm just going to read a brief bio. William Hazelgrove is a best-selling author whose books include Shots Fired in Terminal 2, Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson, Forging a President, How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt, and Al Capone and the 1933 World's Fair. He has written articles and reviews for USA Today and other publications. Hazelgrove has been interviewed on NPR's All Things Considered. He's been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, USA Today, People, NBC, WBEZ, and WGN. He was the Ernest Hemingway writer in residence, and he runs a political cultural blog, The View from Hemingway's Attic. Please welcome Mr. William Hazelgrove. Hi, William. Hello. Wow. Such an intro. And those great programs. Well, I don't think I should do mine. I should just wait for those. <laughs> You're welcome to join us. They sound much more interesting. Um, okay. Thanks for everybody coming. Big crowd tonight. This is great. Um, and just a little quickly about the kind of books I write. You know, I try and get under history. Um, if any of you read my books before, you kind of know that about me. And it actually started with this one, uh, First Woman President, Edith Wilson. I ran the country from 1919 to 1921. Uh, something a lot of people didn't know. And then this just came out, Reading the Gilded Age. If you're watching and you're watching the show, The Gilded Age, this is right in there, or Inventing Anna. This is a very early con woman. And then of course, this is Titanic, which also just came out in the fall. And I pretty much get under the mythology of Titanic in that one and give you a side you have not heard. And of course, this is Al Capone, 33 World's Fair. If any of you read Devil in the White City, this is the second fair 40 years later. But that's not why we're here. We're here for this. Um, the Darkest Winter, of the Revolution War and the plot to kidnap George West Washington. Uh, you know, a lot of times I stumble on topics. This is one that I just did not know about. And uh, I did not know there was a plot to kidnap George Washington. And it wasn't a plot, it was an expedition that, that was launched. So it's a little misleading to say the plot because it sounds like it didn't get off the ground, but it very much did. And this is also a winter that is unbelievable. It makes Valley Forge look like nothing. So we're going to talk about all of that. Um, but let's set the stage. Really, uh, in 1779, the, the British were like these two guys here and the Americans, where they're just, just really weary boxers trying to knock out each other. Um, it, it had just become this long war uh, when nobody expected. Everybody thought the British would come right in and just finish us off. Uh, of course, we proved right away at Boston that wasn't going to be the case when uh, we forced the British out of, out of Boston. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but the biggest thing was the Americans had really learned that if they could just last, um, that they could beat the British. Uh, the British were still using the old tactics of war, uh, which is you fight like gentlemen, uh, you line up on either side, and three rows uh, with uh, each man between the shoulder of the next. And you fire these volleys. Um, and uh, it's very orchestrated and, you know, whoever is left standing wins and then a very civilized surrender ceremony. And it all takes place also uh, during the nice months, uh, spring, summer, a little bit of fall, but then like gentlemen, everybody goes into winter quarters and, you know, enjoys themselves basically for the winter before the war games begin again. Uh, the first thing the Americans did was uh, decide, well, we aren't going to play that way. Um, and this was very frustrating to the British because they had always faced European armies that fought exactly the way they did. But the Americans under George Washington learned very quickly that the tactics of the Viet Cong were really the way to go, which was basically you, you hit, and, hit and run. Um, and that, the Americans were, had a couple of advantages. One, we were on our home turf. Two, the land area was massive. So the British really couldn't hold it. And three is we knew how to shoot um, very well uh, because we'd been out in the frontier um, everybody had a gun, you know, and, uh, these long rifles. 
And so the Americans were able to go into a forest, get down behind a, a rock or a tree, uh, pick off a British soldier, and then disappear. Um, and this was very frustrating to the British because every time they thought they had George Washington, he disappeared. He just would you know, slip away. They thought they had him in New York. He slipped away there. He thought he was on the ropes in 1776 when he crossed the Delaware and took on the Hessians at Trenton and um, Princeton. And, you know, he just would not go down. And again, uh, Washington quickly realized that if he could just survive, he was going to beat the British because the war is very expensive for the British. Incredibly expensive. I mean, war, you know, we're sort of watching the, the Russians go into Ukraine now. Well, they haven't gone in all the way yet, but when they do, it's going to get, A, very expensive and it's going to get very bloody. So, you know, that changes it very quickly. And we'll see how the Ukrainians fight. The Ukrainians fight. My guess is they're going to kind of do the same things. Um, but, you know, so this was really a war of two sides sort of waiting for the other to say, I've had enough. So here comes the winter of 1779. And George Washington decides he's going to winter in Morristown, which is a 30 miles away from the Hudson River. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, has the Washington Mountains around it. Um, it's sort of fortified. Uh, he feels like he can, he can winter there. Now, this is going to turn out to be a very, very, very brutal winter. It's going to, and I'm talking about climate-wise, it is going to be the one in a century winter uh, it, that will just bring snowstorm after snowstorm, incredibly frigid temperatures, so cold that the Hudson will have a once in a century occurrence and it will freeze solid. Um, and this is going to affect uh, what happens in Morristown in the kidnapping of George Washington very, very, very much. Um, you know, Washington assumed he could pretty much sort of lick his wounds. Um, now, let's talk about a little bit about the army. The army is not great. It's barely holding together. The war has worn down the Americans uh, in a way that probably hasn't worn on the British because the British at least are well-fed and, and well-clothed. And this is not true of the American. We'll talk about that some more. But, you know, usually what happens with these, you know, plots to kidnap a, a general or a head of state is it's, it begins with somebody who's disgruntled. And that would be this guy. Um, this is General Simcoe. And General Simcoe is a British officer. Um, and he doesn't believe the Americans' cause is just at all. In fact, he doesn't even recognize the Americans as an army. Um, he thinks they're a rabble. And he basically goes on a raid to, uh, you know, intercept some boats that were going to be used against the British. But what happens is he gets knocked off his horse by the Americans and taken prisoner. Well, General Simcoe has a very high, high regard for himself, and he believes he should be treated as a British general should be treated. Well, the Americans take him prisoner and immediately throw him in a local jail with a drunk. And General Simcoe is furious about this. Um, he almost, by the way, he almost gets uh, shot by a very young soldier who doesn't really know who he is. Um, another soldier wants to run a bayonet through him. So really, he, he's lucky to be alive. But now he's in this jail. And so he writes letters saying uh, to George Washington, saying, I'm being treated badly. Um, I protest this. Uh, I demand to be traded. So Washington um, doesn't respond to those letters, but they do offer a trade. They're going to give back some British soldiers, and they'll give them back Simcoe. Or rather, they'll give them Simcoe and they'll give some American soldiers. Well, Simcoe is outraged because there are no American generals that are going to be traded for him. And in his mind, he's worth more than a couple of lowly privates. So he refuses to be traded. And again, he is in this dark, dingy cell uh, where he feels, again, insult upon insult. And actually, he has sympathetic ears in the American government um, who... Uh, you know, not everybody believed in the revolution. It was probably 50-50 at this point. And nobody was quite sure who was going to win. So people were sort of playing both sides against the middle. So he actually had a 
sort of parade of high level Americans coming and going and saying, yes, this is disgusting the way you're being treated. And again, he writes Washington, again, Washington doesn't respond. And Simcoe sees this as a great insult that Washington does not respond to him and, and you know, immediately pull him out of this dark, dirty jail and, or at least find a general to trade for him, you know, an American general being held by the British. So finally, finally they work out a trade and Simcoe is given back to the British where he starts to foment and brood about how he was so ill-treated by the Americans, but mostly how he was ill-treated by George Washington. Now, they, the, the Americans, talk a little bit more about this. The Americans have been worn down by years of war with the British. Uh, when they come to Morristown, they, they build a thousand log cabins, which they call it a log city. And uh, they, they're a lot more barefoot. Um, uh, classically, they have nothing to eat and they haven't been paid for years. Um, and they're starting to feel like America is tired of the war too. And in fact, they're starting to feel like nobody really cares about them. And that, you know, Americans are on with their lives and they see that the army is an imposition and, and they're very reluctant to give them food. Uh, it gets worse. Um, the Americans, uh, know that the surrounding farmers have food, but they aren't giving it up. Why? Because the currency of the, the colonies of America was worthless. Um, it was, uh, if you had a wheelbarrow of the currency, the wheelbarrow would be worth more than the currency. And so these farmers, these American farmers had all these foodstuffs that they could have given to the army, hold off for what's called the London market. And the London market it's basically this you know, market where the British will pay gold for food. And that's who they sell their food to. And the American soldiers know this. So they feel very much left alone. And the truth is, Americans had grown weary of the war. It was not fast. It had been grinding on and on. Um, and again, a lot of people thought the Americans were gonna lose. So you know, a lot of the people, a lot of Americans, felt like, you know, let's just go back with uh, the British and, and call it, go back with England. Um, so this is a real moment of truth for the American army and for the cause, for the revolution itself. Now, so Washington's up there and then this one in a million event occurs, the freezing of the Hudson. So what does this mean? All right, so the British are in New York in the Hudson freezes. Now, before the Hudson freezing, it was a protected moat. Suddenly, it's a bridge. It's a bridge to Morristown. And, and this is a great change because now the armies can go back and forth. Washington go across it, the British can go across it. And, and, and nobody understands quite the implication of this, but Washington, who is up in Morristown, starts to get letters letting him know that, you know, this has occurred and that, um, you know, this could change, you know, his the level of protection he has in Morristown. Um, yet yet he, he still feels very protected up there. Um, there's a lot of snow coming down. He doesn't think anybody can go through all this snow. You know, Washington's a very interesting man. Um, he's, in one sense, he's a very anal man who, um, his favorite saying is uh, every Mick, a lot of Mickles and add up to a muckle, which is a Scottish idioms, meaning basically small things add up. And he was very specific about what anything that happened at Mount Vernon. In fact, even during the war, he was writing back to the people working on his home about very specific things he should do. But at the same time, at the same time, he's a wild man. He, uh, he doesn't like inaction. And so this, if you, I wrote a book called Henry Knox, the Noble Train, and this is a picture from that. Um, basically, when Washington takes over the army uh, outside of Boston, it's just a rabble. And the, the British are in Scots and, they have, and the Americans have no artillery. So you can't lay siege unless you have artillery. So Henry Knox is a 25-year-old bookseller. And up in Fort Ticonderoga, the Americans took the fort, Benedict Arnold took it. Uh, there's 
120,000 pounds or 60 tons of artillery cannons. And it's 300 miles away, it's winter, so they're virtually worthless to the Americans. But George Washington is eyeing that and he realizes that if he can get these cannons um, and put them up in the heights of Dorchester, which is a big cliff that overlooks Boston, he can force the British out. So he gets Henry Knox to go do it. And this is a picture of how they did it. They use oxen and sleds and they drag the cannons 350 miles in the worst winter ever over frozen mountains, lakes, uh, rivers. Um, again, and you know, they, they fall through the rivers, they go through the lakes. Uh, you know, some of these cannons weigh 5,000 pounds. And again, the British think nobody could ever go and get this, these cannons and bring them in the winter. And first of all, the British are all in Boston having dinner, going to the theater, enjoying something. This is what the British did in the winter. You know, gentlemen don't fight in the winter. So they, they, they couldn't believe that the Americans would go out and do something crazy like this. But they do. Washington puts up the cannons up on Dorchester Heights. The British wake up to this incredible bombardment, and they're forced out of Boston to give the Americans their first victory. So this is a very bold move. Same thing with crossing the Delaware on Christmas. Right. I mean, this is just um, this is a very uh, unheard of thing to do again in winter. Uh, the British think Washington's finished. They'll finish them off in the spring. But Washington knows these Hessian, these mercenaries or these British mercenaries are all at Trenton and, and Princeton. And he crosses the Delaware with this ragtag army and half of them don't even make it across. But the ones that do fight like banshees and and they beat back the British. You know, at Trenton and New Jersey and take all these prisoners. Um, so again, he is capable of this, these wild um, movements that throw the British off. And at the same time, he's this very measured man. So he has this strange dualities to his personality. Also, by the way, he was very physically uh, strong. He was very tall for his time, he was 6'2", and his strength was legendary. So he, so he, so he, so he sort of had this Superman quality, and of course he never, he never could seem to get shot. He would be up there on a big white horse, you know, directing his troops, and the bullets would just go right by him. So he was a part deity. And and, and here's another thing: he he was the revolution at this point, and that's how the British thought of him. They thought, you know, if you could get rid of Washington, the revolution would end. And they they were and they were right. Washington was the revolution at this point. So that, that was the thought, get rid of Washington and you won. And, you know, and this was, uh, you know, the, these plots um, to go kidnap him, uh, this was sort of unorthodox, but this was a war of unconventional methods. Uh, this was what was called the turtle. And this was, the Americans came up with this for a submarine. And this thing would go up and would go up to a British ship that was say in the harbor and they had a torpedo one right in the front and they'd stick that torpedo in the side of the ship and then the guy would pedal away he had a little propeller that he did by paddles and uh and then it would sink the ship well they tried it unfortunately they went up to the ship to stick the torpedo in and there was all this metal sheathing around the rudder so they couldn't get through it and so they figured okay forget it they started to pedal away the british saw them and started to fire on them and uh basically they sunk and you know the guy the pilot inside swam out and swam to safety but it didn't quite work out but this was shows you how the unorthodox methods were, were widely at play in the revolution because everybody wanted to see if they could just get a knockout punch something that you know would just knock the other side out of the game um and you know this was had happened before uh, there was a plot um brad Meltzer wrote a book on it um, the plot to kill Washington uh, in New York, where, you know, one of uh, Washington's own men in his lifeguard unit, we'll talk about them a little bit in a moment, um, had thrown with the British to basically set up an assassination plot to kill Washington. And it was foiled, but it was, it was in play. So, you know, and this was, um, these plots, there was actually a plot, too, to kidnap Martha Washington from Mount Vernon. They were going to, the British were going to send a ship down the Potomac 
and go up there, grab her from Mount Vernon, take her, and then hold her for ransom, basically saying, you know, end the war, or we're going to, you know, do something nasty with her. And uh, and Washington found out about this and was out, outraged. But it was on both sides, because uh, Washington's side had also tried to kidnap several, you know, generals on the British side that didn't, didn't quite work out. And again, you know, a lot of people at this time were betting America was going to lose the war. The biggest person who was betting and who's very much a part of this story in my book is Benedict Arnold. This is him here. Um, and Benedict Arnold, of course, comes down to us as this great traitor, which he was, and his uh, wife, Peggy Shifflin. But, but Arnold was not different from a lot of people at the time. Arnold had a uh, badly disfigured leg. He lost all his money during the revolution. He was bitter. He uh, felt like he had given it all for the revolution. He'd been passed over for promotion. Uh, he didn't see how he could get his money back. And so he and his wife basically said, you know what? We deserve better. And let's go to the British and see what, what terms we get. Because you know what? The Americans are going to lose anyway. So you know, might as well try and get out where the getting's good. And just on the side, you know, the, he, he basically sold himself out for $10,000, um, which today is probably, you know, 200,000 or something. But the point is, um, this was not a foregone conclusion America was going to win. And so, you know, it's this very, very harsh winter in 1779. Um, you know, the revolution was in trouble, very much so. And, you know, Valley Forge is always held up as the worst winter. That's what history has handed down to. But it's just not true. Uh, Morristown was. And here's one of the actual log cabins that uh, were constructed. And by the way, these uh, log cabins were constructed to Washington's specificity. He had a very, very specific design and each log cabin had to, under the supervision of the officers, be built to his specific design. Um, and, uh, and this is just Washington. Washington believed that, you know, uh, Order was the only weapon against chaos. And especially if you're an army that's barely holding together, then you have to be incredibly strict. And he was. And you know, this would be like four to six men would be in this little cabin for the winter. It was smoky, uh, horrible ventilation, uh, not a lot of food and, and a lot of disease, um, smallpox and all sorts of diseases uh, were carrying a lot of people off. And these, these really became hellish, these little log cabins. And there's a thousand of these. Now, Washington did something very different in Morristown. He took up his headquarters at the Ford home, the Ford mansion. And here's what was different about it. It was miles from his troops. So, you know, his troops were like two to three miles away. So if something happened, it would take us a while to get there. But Washington, Washington expected to live like a general. Um, and this is a whole nother story to this, but he would pass up several headquarters as not nice enough. Um, and that was just the way it was. And the officers led a very charmed life and certainly the generals did. And even at the Ford Mansion though, it was pretty cold. You know, it was all wood heated, obviously. Um, and Mrs. Ford, Mr. Ford had died. But Mrs. Ford was still there with her family. So Washington's headquarters had to sort of navigate around the family but the, the takeaway from this is it's very, very far from his troops. And by the way, the British know this because there's lots and lots of spies everywhere. And the word comes to the British in New York that Washington is staying more time very far from his troops. Now, why, why we do it? Well, because of these guys. Um, Washington believed he was fine. He was safe. Um, and that's because of his lifeguard unit. This is his secret service. Um, you know, we're so used to the Secret Service, these guys with the little thing in their ear and the earphone and running around the president. Well, this was a unit that Washington had handpicked, and each man had to have a certain physical specification. So it had to be pretty tall, physically tough, uh, it had to be beyond reproach. And this was, and their whole their whole function was to guard Washington, was to make sure that he stayed safe. And so their uh, cabins were pretty close to the Ford mansion. Um, and a lot of times the lifeguard units would do tasks for Washington. 
uh, you know, sort of secretarial tasks a lot of times, moving papers around, doing things, taking messages. So, you know, they weren't just hanging around in case somebody tried something on Washington. They were actually, you know, they were sort of advanced guard. They set up the Ford Mansion. They made sure everything was just so for Washington. But this, this was who Washington depended on to keep him safe against, say, a kidnapping attempt. Now, General Simcoe, uh, he had something that's called the Queen's Rangers. Uh, and remember, now, Simcoe has been badly treated, but he heads up this sort of elite group called the Queen's Rangers, who are basically like the SEAL Team Six of their time for the British. Uh, they, have, they, they have carbines, uh, they can shoot from their saddle at a full gallop. Uh, they're very light and very fast. And then that's, that's their design, to sort of hit fast and go. So, uh, and Simcoe, like Washington, is handpicks his men. And so, you know, these, these Queen Rangers are the best of the best of the British. And this lightning force, it gives Simcoe an idea uh, how to end the war, basically, and, and also to take revenge on, you know, the dishonor he felt from Washington. And he comes up with a plan. And this plan, is pretty simple. Um, it, it basically, it hinges though on the Hudson being frozen. And so his plan is this, he'll take his Queen's Rangers, this lightning force of men, and they'll cross the Hudson at night. Um, go across, and again, this is now just a bridge. It's just, you know, Simcoe goes down to look at it at night. That's one of the opening scenes of the book. And uh, he just sees this great snowy expanse going to the other side. And it's thick enough to hold cannon. So this is a real change. This is a real coup, a real resetting of the balance of power here. Um, so they'll cross at night in a great secrecy. Then they'll gallop 35 miles to Morristown. So these are the Queen's Rangers. They stealthy, they gallop up there. And then they'll leave all their horses in a nearby swamp. And, and by the way, they have maps of the area already from spots. Simcoe's been working with his network of spies. He knows exactly where Washington is. He even knows where he is in the Ford Mansion. Um, and they know how far the troops are and where the lifeguard units are and the roads leading up to the Ford Mansion. So, so they know there's a swamp. So they'll go up there to the swamp. They'll leave their horses. Then they'll all switch to moccasins. And they'll creep up very, very quietly, kill any of the lifeguard units guarding the front and back doors. Anybody inside, they'll kill, you know, with a knife, you know, being very quiet. And then they're going to go into the second floor bedroom where Washington's asleep with Martha and pull him out of his bed and basically tie him up. Uh, and this assumes that Washington, by the way, on these kidnapping plans, you, your objective was not to kill your man. Your objective was to get him back and then hold him for ransom and, and negotiate terms. So you don't want to kill him. But this was always a possibility if they resisted. So this is why stealth was a great thing. You know, you wanted to get him out of there, leave Martha sleeping there. As bad, you know, hopefully you don't wake her up. Um, and then ride back across the Hudson before the Americans even wake up, before they even know it hit them, right? So it's basically a race back to the Hudson um, and then get across. And then they're safe. Once they cross that Hudson, they're safe. They're back to the British side. So, so it's, it's a, a bold, daring plan to knock really the Americans out of the war. And again, the British were fatigued with this war. It was unpopular back in Britain and England. It was costing them a boatload of money um, and you know, lives. And so they, want, they wanted to end this thing. And this, and this to Simcoe was the way to do it. Now, again, they all had spies. Um, Washington had spies, the British had spies, and so everybody sort of knows what everybody's doing. And of course, the word gets out about this plot. And Washington receives a letter, and it says basically, listen, there's a plot to come up there and kidnap you. Um, and uh, you know, hope you're taking precautions because we find this, you know, we think this plot is very real. And Washington, and I, so, so now just to set the stage, there are continual snowstorms, just continual. And 
and you, you the roads are impassable as far as Washington's concerned. So he really feels this is, you know, hyperbole that that these this plot is coming off that these guys are going to come down. Besides that, he writes back and says, "Listen, I appreciate that, but you know, I've got my lifeguard. I, I'm safe. I'm I'm fine. So don't worry about me." And this is part of Washington too. Washington never showed any alarm, any panic. Even when he found out about the plot to kill him that came very close, he downplayed it. And he only had one man hung. And he, and that was because he didn't want people to think that the British had come so close to actually killing him and maybe potentially heading off the revolution. So Washington plays it the same way. He's like, you know, you know he, probably, he probably does have this uh, feeling that, you know, he's godlike and that he can't be stopped and that, you know, they, they couldn't kidnap him. But again, these storms, this brutal, brutal cold, he's just thinking, well, you know, there's, there's no way they can come up. And it's true. These storms were just one after another. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. And in this way, it was much worse than Valley Forge. Valley Forge was a mild winter. Um, now, uh, you know, in terms of more people dying in Valley Forge, probably so. Um, but this was worse because these troops were seriously considering, you know, just giving up, uh, just going home. And by the way, there was a lot, a lot of desertions that were occurring. Basically, men would leave at night. And in the morning when they do the muster call, they'd see all the people who left. And Washington didn't play around on this. If you were caught deserting, you were shot or hung. And there were many times where everybody was marched out to go watch a hanging. And because Washington believed that if you didn't stop this, the army would come apart. And he was right because the army uh, had very little food, a lot of disease, um, hadn't been paid. Uh, they were disgruntled. And, and, you know, this led to something that's pretty incredible, which we don't really hear much about in history books, but there was a mutiny. Um, and this mutiny occurred because there was no food. And basically what the men did was they came out of their log cabins and started marching um, without direction. In other words, they were army that said, we aren't gonna listen to anybody. And they were thinking about marching into the nearest town and just, you know, taking food wherever they could find it, going up to any farmer or anybody and just demanding food, basically sort of a, a army out of control. And, you know, several of the officers tried to stop them they threatened the officers and they were marching out of camp when Washington confronted. And he said, you know, I understand. Um, we're going to get you some food, but you have to take the bigger picture here. You know, this, this isn't for us. You know, this, this is for the unborn millions yet to come that this country will be, will be created. You are doing this for people yet to be born. And incredibly, they turned back and, you know, they, they did come up with some food for them and, and sort of got through the crisis. But this is how close the, the, you know, the revolution was to ending right there. Um, it was not preordained. It, it, it could just fall apart at any minute. Um, you know, these allies were not professional soldiers. And a matter of fact, all of them were just militias that were banded together. And again, they, some were literally naked in terms of just no shoes, no hat. Um, and, you know, this winter was so brutal, they're freezing these little log cabins. So this knockout punch that the British hatch um, makes a lot of sense in a way. They, their spies are telling them that, you know, Washington's men are deserting, that uh, there's disease, that his force has fallen to half its strength, um, and that the British can knock them out very easily. And so... Simcoe presents his plan to the higher ups. And basically what happens as what always seems to happen in the military or, or any big organization, people go, hey, that's a pretty good idea. And they take it over. Um, they basically take his plan from him, the higher ups and, and decide, you know what, this is great, but we're gonna add a few things. And Simcoe is suddenly demoted. Um, and, you know, like somebody finding a great invention and then saying, this is good, but we're going to improve on it. Uh, the Usually the original inventor doesn't get the credit. So what do they do? Well, 
they decide we're going to do this thing, but we're going to use the Black Hussars. And the Black Hussars are German mercenaries with uh, death or glory on their, their caps. And they, were, they wore these black caps with sort of this red on them. And they all had sabers. And they were brutal. These were the mercenaries that at Bunker Hill were impaling Americans to trees. And the Black Hussars will be the force that will go actually across. And Simcoe was demoted to creating a diversion. This is actually a HBO show where that's actually how they saw Simcoe. Simcoe, they say, look, uh, we appreciate the plan, but you're going to create a diversion for the Black Hussars, who are actually going to go do the get Washington and bring him back. Um, and so the diversion is going to be where he's going to go sort of attack the Americans and let the Americans think that, you know, he is the British are attacking and suck them all in while the Black Hussars race up and grab Washington while nobody's looking. And, you know, again, it gets bigger. There's like 1,500 men involved now. Um, so it's no longer just the Queen's Rangers that are going to do this. All of the Queen's Rangers are going to go create the diversion. Um, this is now a full-blown expedition to go kidnap George Washington. Now, the, the big danger is here is the Black Hussars are brutal. And there's a good chance they'll just kill Washington. They just, they're just that way. And so, you know, this is, this, this will, could be a real problem. But, you know, the whole thing is maybe even if he's just dead, this will, that'll be the same thing. But, you know, it is no longer Simcoe's, Simcoe's show. He is now on the sideshow of a diversion. So they launched the raid. A uh, very cold night. Um, now, they were waiting for the snow to let up, and the snow had been just steady. And so finally it cleared one night, and, and they go across the Hudson. And Simcoe goes first, and then the Black Hussars start heading for Morristown. Um, they know from their spies that Washington is asleep upstairs in the Ford Mansion with Martha. And, you know, they, and they also know that the light, how far the lifeguard is staying the cabins down from the Ford Mansion. There's just a few men there who are actually protecting Washington. So this is really the perfect time for them to launch this attack. Um, Washington doesn't really believe in it. Um, he's not well protected by the lifeguard. And, and they've got this incredible one in a century opportunity to cross the Hudson and get up there, get him, and then bring him back. So Simcoe immediately does what he's supposed to do. He, he goes racing up, creates all this noise, races into towns. Uh, and, you know, and the Americans um, had sort of a signaling system up on the Washtenaw Mountains where they had actually these big, uh, think of piles of wood, built up like a big triangle. And they would light these if the British were coming. And so they lit the, these big piles of wood and everybody said, oh, the British are coming. And they all start moving towards Simcoe, who's creating this diversion. So when they all start moving toward him, Simcoe then turns around with the Queen's Rangers and heads back toward the Hudson, pulling the Americans with him. And, you know, the Americans are just think, you know, we've got him on the run. And, but what Simcoe's doing is he's, he's pulling them away from Washington even more. Meanwhile, the Black Hussars are galloping full speed toward the Ford Mansion. And this is going to be a foregone conclusion for them. This is, you know, this this could be this could be it. This this it looks like there's nothing between them and Washington at this point. And these these by the way, these German mercenaries were paid for by the head uh, when they bought them from Germany, and then there was actually a bounty paid when if they were killed, and uh, and they were promised that they would be able to pillage. Uh, that, you know, one of the ways they enticed them was you can pretty much do what you want to the Americans. We, we don't recognize them as soldiers. We recognize them as rabble. And so, you know, do whatever you want. So they sort of were promised, do what you want. So this is the, these are the guys who were galloping up towards to get George Washington. Now, it starts to snow. And the snow is coming down, and, and they can deal with this, and they keep going and keep going and keep going. But then... It warms up a little and the snow changes to freezing rain. 
Now we all live in the Midwest, we know what happens. The rain comes down and hits that snow that's already down. Now remember, it's been snowing and snowing this winter. And then the temperature drops. It drops like crazy. And this snow, which is now wet on the top, turns into ice, just this hardened ice crust. Now the horses, now we are horsemen, but the horses have forelocks and forelocks is that first joint in their leg. So as these black hussars are galloping toward Washington, these forelocks, this ice starts to cut into the horse's legs. And as this temperature just brutally drops to zero, um, this ice comes like razors and it starts to cut all their forelocks. All this blood is coming out of the horse's forelocks. And the Black Hussars stop. And they're close, they're 10 miles from the mansion. And the captain looks around and he examines the horses. And he realizes then that they aren't going to make it, that these horses will just become lame before they even get, and they will certainly not be able to get back if they continue on. So he pulls out five rockets out of his rucksack, and this is the signal that the mission is off, and he fires them 10 miles from the mansion, and they turn around and have to go back across the Hudson. Um, and they, meanwhile, the Americans have no idea they're still chasing after Simcoe, who's crossing over the Hudson. So it's worked beautifully in terms of the diversion. Washington is basically defenseless, except for a few of his lifeguards. And, you know, you had this whole troop of, of German mercenaries coming to get him, but they have to turn back. And they go back across the Hudson. And so this expedition, this plot to kidnap him is foiled. But the British contemplate a second attempt. But then what happens? the temperature goes up and the Hudson, which was this once in a million lifetime, you know, once in a million freezing of the Hudson, it thaws and it can't hold the men. It can't hold the cannons. It can't hold anything. And so the, you know, the, and Simcoe wants this to go. He wants another shot at this. He's desperate to do this, but they don't get that other attempt. And Washington hears about the attempt and very much in Washington fashion. He keeps it on the down low. He finds out how close they came because they can see it in the snow. And he basically doubles his lifeguard and, and has them move very close to him. And in matter of fact, he starts to move around himself. So he understood how close. But again, in Washington, Washington never wants to give the enemy any precept or any way to say success or how close they came. And they came close. And so, and in fact, the British don't want to, this to get out. And, you know, years later, um, this is kept a secret because they felt this was sort of a, a dirty trick, a sort of dirty way to fight. And George Washington and the Continental Army fight on. And there is a battle of Morristown that, fo that follows this, where Washington prevails. Uh, but this was certainly their winter of discontent. This was... The, the worst winter of the revolution where it all, they almost lost it all, um, except Washington lived to fight another day. And that, that would be until 1883 at Yorktown where uh, the French would come in. And by the way, this is all in the book. I can't get into this now, but the French were very much a part of this in terms of they had promised support before this, the support had come. But after this winter, they come in with their support. And again, they, they seal off the British at Yorktown and they win. Obviously, this book's out now. So that is Morristown, the darts winning the Revolutionary War and the plot to kidnap George Washington. And I can certainly take questions now for anybody that has them. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing that story. How incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. So while um, people are typing their questions into the chat uh, okay. or the Q&A, uh, we'll wait for those to come up. Um, I just have a quick question. Were, were they superstitious, like that, that 
good luck kept happening? Did they have a, a sort of divine sort of superstitious feeling about all of it? Or um, were they just like, well, that's dumb luck for you? You mean the Americans? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Uh, I, Washington called it the honorable cause and people like uh, Henry Knox believed uh, it was, America was divinely inspired that you know God uh, meant for America to appear. And so it was uh, a holy cause. I'm not sure why, Washington was a religious man to a, a point, um, but he, before he took over, he was living off his wife's money uh, on a plantation. And this really allowed him to fulfill his destiny and to, uh, you know, take on the honorable cause, as he called it. And so, yes, they believed they were divinely inspired. And certainly Washington, as time passed, became half deity, half man. Um, the people believed uh, he was almost supernatural. And the British started to believe it, too because they just couldn't get him. And, uh, and this is just another case where providence, luck, weather, call it what you want, fate. And, I, you know, and I've written a lot of narrative nonfiction books or you know, history rather. And uh, one thing I've come to believe in is fate with a lot of people, be it Wilbur Wright, Teddy Roosevelt, um, Edith Wilson, uh, it's their fate. And this is certainly true of George Washington. It was his fate to lead America and be the first president and lead this country because by all rights, he should have been killed many times over. He should have been captured. His army should have been destroyed. Uh, this was the, this, they were going to get uh, against the equivalent of a superpower today. And the American army was nothing. So this is just another case where by all rights, they had him, but Providence dealt them a blow and they never made it. Wow. Okay, well, we did have some questions that just popped up in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so Paul wants to know about your research. Um, where did you get all your info for your book and how was it recorded? Um, yeah, uh, you know, real quickly, you anybody here can go to williamhazegrove.com and there's quite a bit of information on the book, research and media. I did a lot of interviews for this book, so they'll tell a lot. But I will say here, um, you know, I used a lot of letters, uh, diaries, um, uh, actually newspaper articles, if you can believe it. Um, and then General Simcoe wrote a book. And again, most people never wrote about this. Uh, it was viewed as sort of a dark secret. And uh, especially after, you know, America and uh, England became very close, um, nobody really wanted to talk about that they were going to try and kidnap George Washington or using these German mercenaries. So it really kind of skirted history for a long time. And then, you know, certain things were held up like Valley Forge. And that's always is held up as the hardest winter of the revolution. Um, so, you know, history is a lot of mythology. A lot of things get pushed up. Other things get pushed down. And Morristown just didn't make the cut for a long time. So when I stumbled on this, you know, this plot to kidnap George Washington, I, you know, I really realized this really was their, their moment of truth, you know, that, you know, they were either going to fall apart or go on. And so anyway, I answered the question. So I, I did, he did leave a book behind. Um, there was a lot of letters that there was a surgeon um, that traveled with the army who kept an extensive, um, uh, you know, diary. Um, and so, you know, you sort of piece all these together. And um, uh, there was uh, some official documents as well that I was able to get hold of and sort of stitch it together. And then you, you sort of go, well, what makes most sense? How did this play out, you know? And, and, um, and that's really sort of how I put it together. All right. Well, we have a great follow up from another uh, person in Q&A. How do you choose the subjects for your books? Oh, great question. Um, basically what I do is, um, you know, I, I sort of read other people's work. Um, I think this was referenced in, uh, another history book might've been by David McCullough. Uh, and usually what happens is people will reference something just sort of obliquely or like with a sentence, 
And I'll bet, what did they just say? And, you know, like take Madam President, there was a big biography on Wilson um, by Scott Berg. And he wrote in there basically, um, oh, well, she was almost the president. And I was like, what? And so then I sort of go after that. And this is with Morristown. There was a reference to a plot to kidnap George Washington. I, I it was an, actually, it was an article in a magazine. And I read that article and I thought, what, what is this? And first I thought it was the plot to assassinate him, which Brad Meltzer wrote about, but it wasn't. It was this whole, ex and by the way, Brad Meltzer's book, it never, that, it never came to fruition. Nothing ever happened. They just basically plotted and they got foiled. Nothing happened. This went all the way. This was 10 miles away from you know, the mansion. They were there. So this was actually an expedition to kidnap George Washington. This was a military campaign that actually came off. So this is very different than, you know, oh, you know, these people are talking about, you know, maybe kidnapping or a plot or, you know, this was actually a full-blown military expedition to kidnap George Washington. So I read that article and then I just started to dig. And then you start to piece it together. Well, what really, and then I came upon the, the worst winter of the revolution, how that played in. And then you start to put it all together. All right. Well, I can say from experience, because I've had you with us so many times as a presenter, that you do have a knack for finding those little hidden gems in a larger history book and sort of narrowing down and, and coming up with that narrative, you know, of what that one story was about within, you know, somebody's entire biography. There's that, that thing that nobody else has got to yet. Yeah, and you know, and again in the book, uh, Benedict Arnold is a big player in this, and and you know I can't go into that because it's such a big part, but this was moving simultaneously with this plot, and he was he was in communication with the people who were working on the expedition to plot to kidnap George Washington, and his thing blows up at exactly the same time that this plot to kidnap George Washington is foiled because they can't get there, and you know. That's a fascinating story of how close he came to giving up uh, West Point, the fort. And that was basically what he was going to give, get 10,000 bucks for and then leave. Um, and that blew up exactly the same time. But, you know, in the book, I take all these parallel stories and they all move together at the same thing until they come into this big denouement at the end. And then again, there's a huge battle for Morristown at the very end of, of the book. So this, you know, I sort of skimmed the rooftops with this um, presentation, but really, you know, if you read the book, there's, it's really fascinating the way, you know, how close everything came to just falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then we do have another question um, from Tech Res. We, he wants to know, did they travel on the Whippany River to get to Morristown? Um. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't want to say for sure, um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure the, the name really uh, sounds uh, sounds familiar to me because in the uh, Battle for Morristown, one of the pivotal moments is the British go down into a river, and the Americans are hot on the high side, and the British think the river is shallow, but in fact it's deep, and they all get caught down there, and the Americans just pour down fire on them. Um, so that might be the river that he's citing there. Okay. All right. Well, if there's anybody else out there with a question, we'll hang in there for another minute so you have a chance to type that in. Um, but yeah, just to follow up with your previous uh, comments, William, about um, all of that, I was just thinking that it's so funny that so many plots were happening at the same time that maybe part of the reason none of them worked was that there were different egos at play among certain high-ranking British oh, yeah. uh, officers who are all sort of in competition with each other instead of working that's together. Right. Well, that's right. In the British, um, it was all who you are. And again, you know, you can go to my website, williamhaysgrove.com, there's more on that, but it's who your family was. And that pretty much determined what rank you were. Um, and the Americans, it was based on merit. So, you know, somebody said, hey, I, you know, something's going on. People listen to them. In the British Army, people wouldn't listen to them. They'd say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And, the, and even the spies, you know, they were, they were always very skeptical of the spies. And so you're right. It was, it was more of a, uh, you know, a system where 
you know, the aristocracy was the officer class and then there was everybody else. All right. Well, we've had some people chiming in to say thank you. So interesting. And I have to agree, another really interesting topic. So thanks again for being here. Um, and then just so everyone knows, again, you are going to be back on Monday, March 28th to talk about one of your other brand new books, Greed in the Gilded Age, The Brilliant Con of Cassie Chadwick. Yeah. And I'll also say, if anybody wants to send me an email at bhazelgrove at gmail, I can put you on my list because uh, I got like 38 speeches scheduled. So it's B Hazelgrove, this B is in boy, Hazelgrove at Gmail. And I'll put you on my mailing list so you'll know where I'm speaking next. All right. Thanks so much, William. It was great to have you. And we'll see you again in March. Oh, thanks so much. All right. Have a good night, everyone.